Hi, everybody who's joined our webinar today. We're so happy to have you. This is uh, June Bauer. I'm speaking to you from Grid Dynamics, who's sponsoring this webinar. Our webinar is about giving your customer experience an edge and talking about the future of edge platforms. We're so, so delighted to have you join us to spend time with us today. And I'm really pleased to say that we have some amazing panelists with us today that are going to help us understand uh, the whole, shall we say, fog around the uh, edge experience. So um, really happy about our panelists, really happy to have you join. And I wanted to just let you know quickly what our agenda looks like for today. My name is June Bauer. I'm going to be hosting this webinar, and we're going to start by introducing our amazing panel, who has uh, some very, very uh, interesting things to share with us today. And then we're going to have a panel discussion with some questions to our panelists that hopefully will illuminate this whole topic for us. And finally, we're going to have a Q&A, and that's where we invite you to participate. If you have questions during the presentation today, we really encourage you to use your Q&A you'll find uh, on your Zoom bar, at typically at the bottom of your screen. If you press on Q&A and put a question in, we'll monitor it, and we'll hopefully be able to get to many of your questions towards the end of our webinar today. So encourage you to type questions in at any time, but we'll probably take most of them towards the end of the webinar. Again, really excited to have you all join. I want to take a few minutes just to introduce our amazing panel. So... I am going to do this the best way possible, which is to let our panelists actually introduce themselves. I want to start with Tom. So, Tom, do you want to introduce yourself to the wonderful group we have here online today? Hi, Tom Barnett with Lumen Technologies. You probably knew us as CenturyLink at some time. And uh, believe it or not, we still have a division called CenturyLink under the Lumen Technologies Group. The big reason we rebranded is because of Edge and because of a different focus for the, the corporation itself. Uh, we're focused more on technology solutions and opportunities we can do with that, but more importantly, our commitment to Edge and the Edge programs that come with it and what we can do with that. That's fantastic. Thank you. And, and Brad, how about you? All right, thank you. Uh, Brad Corian with Intel Corporation, actually part of our what we call our Internet of Things group. And one of our big pushes is to understand how we can deploy uh, compute and technology sensing and analytics at the edge. My team and our focus is in community building, open source projects, investing uh, in all of the technologies that are going to enable uh, this transformation and make deployable the, the capabilities of edge computing. Sounds like a great job. I'm envious. And Romeo, would you like to introduce, introduce yourself, please? Of course, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, I'm Romeo Zikihor, and I'm the regional CIO for Samex USA. Samex is one of the largest uh, building materials company in the world, and we operate in, in, in 50 countries around the globe. Glad to be here. Boy, that's a big global operation you've got there. That's very impressive. And our final panelist is Max. Max, you want to introduce yourself? Sure, Jim. My name is Max Martinov. I am CTO of Grid Dynamics. I am responsible for our uh, solution development. And uh, uh, one of our uh, latest solutions that we are bringing to the market uh, at, at Grid Dynamics is uh, to help companies accelerate their movement to the edge and implement new customer experience and platforms at the edge. All right. I love it. You can see we've got a really well-rounded round, panel, but also four people with amazing experience in computing and in edge technology. So I'm excited to learn from you all today. But before we do that, I want to just get a show of hands. If you see on the um, webinar that you can raise your hand, I just want to ask you guys to raise your hand. Does everybody see that, I hope? Raise your hand. If you can't figure out how to do that, just chat me a message. But I want to hear what is the primary benefit driving your company's interest right now in edge computing? I put down a few of these. I'm going to just call one out and let's see, you know, how many of you, if you want to raise your hand, think that creating a better user experience is your first, first choice? Just go ahead and raise your hand or chat to me. And maybe, maybe if you just want to go into the chat, it might be more interesting for us to all hear right down of these, these ones I wrote down, or if I didn't hit the one that you're interested in. Please chat something else to us. Okay. Hopefully you all got a chance to 
think about that or chat. I'd love it if you were willing to chat so we know a little bit better and that way we can help tailor our presentation to you. I, I was also interested in what your top challenge is in Im implementing a complete edge platform. And you know, you may be wondering how to get started or how to train your team, how to manage all the data that you're getting, or maybe consolidate your new data with the data that you already have, build an architecture that's going to scale, potentially create a single powerful user experience or get how do you get help to build this out? Potentially budget may be your challenge or maybe creating a competitive advantage. Any thoughts on that? Anybody want to share what they're, what they're trying to do? I see a few people. Don't be shy if you want to share. I mean, I think we'll do a better job for you, but if, if, you, if you're not comfortable, that's no problem as well. So we've got a few user, user experience and also architectural questions. I think these are great. Okay. Well, thanks. And if there's something you want us to focus on, you're not hearing during the webinar, make sure to put a, a question into the question box or chat us something. So I, I want to start by telling you a story. About seven years ago, I got my first electric vehicle and it was really exciting. And I loved it. I mean, because what I found out was not only was it electric, but like the car was fully connected and I could stream music and podcasts and I could use the internet and I was automatically connected to GPS. I mean, it was just like, you know, the electric part was cool, but the user experience of being in the car and having all this connectivity was even more amazing. And, you know, on one of the first days I was driving the car down the road and all of a sudden, womp, I hit a big pothole. And I thought, oh my God, like, this is terrible. Like I just got a new car and I'm now I'm just driving in potholes. This is terrible. It's terrible on the wear and tear for the car. and. And then something dawned on me and I thought, gee, with all these connected vehicles, why couldn't the vehicles who came before me and went through that same pothole have sent some sort of a message back to the mothership and said, hey, there's a pothole here. And when people are approaching it, you should warn them about it, right? So that I would have known not to, not to go right over that pothole and to, to go around it. So frustrating but also a great case for edge computing. That is a great opportunity for a company that has connected cars to be able to figure that out and offer that value by, connect, by collecting data from cars, analyzing the data, and then turning it into a usable piece of information back to the cars. So, I, I mean, I think it goes to show that there are just thousands of use cases for edge computing, as we're seeing more and more connected devices, you know, be, becoming essentially, you know, computers. I mean, everything we do today, you know, from, from our phones to machines on a factory floor to, you know, the retail experience, everything is becoming connected. And it's really a beautiful vision to connect all these things for companies. But I think the reality is that, you know, as the people who need to implement that vision, our, our paths in the future may be filled with many potholes. It may not be as easy as we think it's going to be. So today, what I thought we could do is to help you by letting you know about what are some of the potholes in building this platform of the future, this edge platform of the future, and also what are some of the big opportunities to do that so that you can effectively build out your edge platform that's gonna serve you today and into the future. So let's get started. I've got some great questions for our panelists that I'm gonna to wanna to ask them and you may have some of your own. So feel free to chime in. Let's get started with our conversation and I have a first question and Romeo, I'm gonna throw this one to you, which is you know, from the end user point of view, what do you see as the future of the user experience, say five years from now? Thank you, June. Um, I hope and I wish I have a crystal ball, but I don't, right? But I, I think in five years, you know, I think of single touch, right? Push rather than pull technologies will become mainstream. So let me give you some examples. In the CRM space, you know, customers will you know, we'll just need to swipe right to reorder or pay. You know, something that is already happening right now, 
but I think this will be our default default way of buying in the future. So I mean, all of this and, and payment processing will also be empowered using technologies like blockchain. In the SEM or supply chain management space, I think IoT devices will start you know, prompting us or the consumers to automatically trigger the supply chain sourcing you know, and look for that cheapest option with the fastest delivery time and, and from the most reputable supplier. You know? So I think those are you know, becoming more and more mainstream, right? Uh, but not a lot of enterprises or companies are adapting that. You know? In our case, particularly in the manufacturing industry, you know, one of the main challenges that we have is, is maintenance. You know? So to, to keep, you know, the machine running all the time, most of the time, right? But, you know, we are not ready for that. You know? So I think uh, the older technologies that we have are preventing us to, to get there. But in the future, I see at least in, in, in the next five years, you know, IoT, industrial IoT is going mainstream. So that machines will actually tell the maintenance team or maintenance team, you know, to fix them because or their components because they are not feeling well. So I think that those type of interaction between human to human, uh, so, sorry, human to machine interactions or machine to machine interactions will be a main thing. Oh, I love that. I, I love the idea of, you know, every every machine is now starting to be a source of data. And if you can put that data to use, it's going to be really amazing. That's fantastic. Tom, from your perspective, what do you see that future vision looking like? So there's several different levels to this, but uh, to keep it short, we're talking consumer here first. So I'll talk about that. So from my point of view, looking at, you know, from a strategic innovation that I do, AR, VR is going to be huge. And without edge and the low latency that edge products give you and the ability to distribute computing where you need it, to distribute memory storage, those types of things on the fly where you need it was one of the functions of an edge. That's not going to be possible. So using those things, uh, for instance, from uh, logistics, uh, you go to a car parts place now and you look up your car parts and you see a picture and you pick it and you go, oh, that's what I want. Well, you can just put on your hollow lenses, walk outside, look at your car, it recognizes your car and says you're driving a BMW or whatever, and you say tire, and it tells you what tire, front tire, and it picks the front tire and tells you here's the choices, and they show up in front of you, and you can do those types of things. I think also uh, DOD manufacturing are going to do a lot of those things also. That intelligence will be a persona that follows you because the edge will allow you to do that. That persona will go wherever you go. So you're here in the US, you go over to Europe, you connect up over there. Now the edge platform says phones home and says, hey, I, Tom's over here in uh, France right now. We need to know all his data so we can do him a, a better job. But when he's looking and walking down the street and asking me questions, I can do things for him. So that type of Consumer intelligence, customization, those are the things that Edge promises for you in that area. I love that vision, and I especially love the part about the, the car tire, because I think I'm going to need that after having driven through a few potholes. So I appreciate that one. Thank you. And um, Brad, you know, from your perspective, share with us your vision. Well, before I share the vision, I want to touch on the Edge computing in the car that you opened with, June. I think most people forget that the average modern automobile is generating, oh, what's the statistic? I think it's around four terabytes of data a day of daily driving. But of course, we're not uploading all of that data back to the mothership, as you said. So that is, by definition, one of the most popular edge computers we have because we generate that data and we process that data as part of driving, running suspension, running fuel economy, doing all of that work that an automobile has to do. That is quintessentially the definition of using data, uh, analyzing data, using data where the data is generated, in this case, in the automobile, from the automobile. So that's how I open you know, a conversation around edge computing and, and anal anal analysis right where the data is being generated. But to speak to the end user experience, we see this going into probably one of two paths and both are gonna require edge computing. You're either going for hyper convenient, right? We want two hour shipping. So taking Tom's example of the auto parts store, once you choose that tire, I don't wanna wait for it, right? How are you gonna get that tire to me as quickly as possible? 
right? So this is going to be an entire, you know, mind shift change for the average consumer experience. Okay, I'm going to compete by being as convenient as possible. And the other side is how immersive can I be? You know, think, think Disneyland. The reason people love to go to theme parks is because every aspect of their visit is overwhelming, hopefully positively, with characters and, uh, you know, themes and rides and thrills. And, you know, if we water that down a little bit, think of going to the shopping mall. You're not going because it's convenient per se. It might be convenient that there's multiple brands to choose from, but you're going because it's an experience, a little entertainment, be with friends. And uh, retailers, as an example, I think are gonna have to decide, are they there to, to provide convenience and compete with the hyper convenient folks? Or are they there to help you provide um, a, a fun experience that you actually welcome and want to go back and visit? And both convenience and rich, you know, depth of experience uh, requires all sorts of analysis, whether you have to figure out where your parts are, how to get your parts out, where the customer is, how to get it to the customer, or whether it's about um, understanding what section of their journey they're on and how best to give them offers or information or entertainment at that particular moment. Either case, lots of analytics. Yeah, lots of data and lots of analytics, both. I mean, just your the comment you made about the car, it's like almost overwhelming. So things are going to have to change. And I guess that brings me to my next question. And Max, I'm going to throw this one to you. But, you know, what do you think are going to be the technology challenges to getting to some of these incredible ideas that you guys have about what the future will look like? Uh, but before I answer that, I actually want to clarify a little bit because the topic of our today's discussion is edge, right? But uh, edge itself might be uh, like a little bit of an overloaded term and uh, it might uh, span uh, the concepts of fog computing as well when you don't you don't necessarily have like these edge devices, but uh, you have a thousand applications uh, where uh, you want uh, kind of more computing capacity and host your platforms. But it also covers the edge itself with uh, potentially even kind of more devices and uh, more connected cars and uh, other things that uh, will become of this uh, part of the Internet of Things. So having said that, I want to talk about two major, I would say, challenges from my perspective. Today, all of the ma majority of the, of the developers uh, know about the cloud very well. And uh, cloud right now provides you with a very uh, developer-friendly interface, uh, all the CI, CD capabilities, DevOps, platforms, technology stack and so on and so forth. Now, when, I go to the, uh, when we go to the fog or to the edge, it is still not as development friendly and uh, it is still not as uh, operations friendly. And uh, uh, one of the challenges is uh, just having this unified platform that ideally you can use across the cloud, fog and edge uh, to deploy your applications in the same way, in a seamless way. And the second is uh, think about the data that uh, uh, many people touched upon uh, already in this discussion. When we were in the era of uh, data centers, we had relational databases and uh, we had a database uh, maybe deployed on a couple of servers with a replication between them. When we went to the cloud, now the databases, uh, no SQL databases might be deployed on tens, on, on, on tens of the servers. But now when we go to the edge, you need to have data in thousands of locations or maybe in uh, tens of or, or hundreds of thousands of devices. And it's good if it's just analytics because you just need to collect the data from the devices and, and uh, from your locations and send it to the mothership. But you also need to distribute the data back, configuration data, or think about the retail use case when you have a pricing and promotions engine that you are running uh, in a centralized locations and your merchandising team is configuring all the prices and promotions across the stores. But you then need to distribute this data to the respective stores. And the replication here is uh, not even as trivial as you want to have all the data everywhere. You actually want to figure out that, like that in, this, in this particular store, you want to have a pricing data that is relevant only to the store and so on and so forth. So these, I would say, some of the major ones. Hey, I, I would agree with you, Max, and you're making my head hurt because these are going to be huge challenges that we're going to have to figure out how to overcome. And be, we're going to talk about that. Don't leave our webinar yet. We're not going to leave you hanging. But I want to just get one more perspective on what some of the challenges are. And so, um, Brad, I'm going to ask you if you might have some ideas on that. 
Yeah, everything Max said, you know, let's, let's pile on some of the challenges on top of what Max said. Uh, a lot of times our current businesses are run uh, by our vendors, right? So uh, I can think of one retailer who has zero developers on their IT team, but they rely on close working relationships with their vendors. So if you imagine they have 15, 20, 30 vendors providing different systems and you want to create a new experience uh, at the edge, you want to enable curbside pickup where you have to know within 30 seconds if you have availability of a product to, to deliver to someone at the curb, you have to have great confidence both in the sensing and, and systems of knowledge of your inventory um, and that you can work quickly with those vendors or integrate and extract data from existing applications, let alone all the new applications you might have to create. So for me, I think that one of the, uh, the biggest challenges technologically is uh, the integration. You know, it's, it might sound boring, but I think there's actually a steep cliff of working across a broad set of applications, a broad set of devices, um, and a broad set of data formats to be able to pull that data in uh, and make actionable decisions when you need them uh, at the pace of, of innovation that you're trying to achieve. Okay, thank you for piling on. That was actually good, and now I'm... Now I am feeling somewhat overwhelmed, so I think I need some help from Tom. Tom, I'm going to ask you, you know, do you see a place for ed an edge platform to eliminate and help with some of these challenges? I mean, how do you look at it? I mean, one of the big things we always talk about edge is latency and low latency. So for the most part, you're looking at five milliseconds or less, you know, and typically you deal with 50 milliseconds or better out on the internet. So that's one of the big things that comes out of it. So you've got video issues that work much faster. But on top of that, depending on how the interfaces are done and how we do that locally, there's other technologies that make this. So basically, the central office becomes the mainframe of today, right? That's what we're doing. So we're pushing all this power. You don't need to have it localized. You can, uh, as in automobiles like Intel's mentioned there. You can also have it localized in 5G uh, radio heads, right? So you can have it right there on the site and do instant turnaround so that traffic gets handled, processed, and sent back to you almost instantly when you're trying to do things. Uh, an example of that is uh, we just finished a B-52 virtual trainer for Global Strike Command here at Barksdale Air Force Base, and we're using an edge solution for that. Instead of the traditional large uh, link simulators that you've seen all over in buildings manned by 10 people, uh, we're using a Tesla suit and uh, VR glasses to train B-52 pilots on how to fly the aircraft and so forth and give them biofeedback, give them all types of things. Without edge, that's not going to work at the speed it needs to work at. So you're going to be able to do those types of things. Smart materials that are going into buildings. You're actually going to have intelligence built into your buildings in the materials and so forth. I know Romeo probably can talk about that better than me, but there are thoughts on how that's going to happen and be, and be those types of things that will work and react. So the entire area becomes a uh, IoT device, not just pieces of it, not things we hang on the wall, but the entire ecosystem, the entire environment could, turns into an IoT of things that uh, gets large. So handling that much data and taking care of it is a big part of what uh, Edge is going to do for you. Uh, those are some just big things, I think. Well, those are those are great. And those are fantastic examples. And I want a field trip to see that trainer for the B-52s. That sounds so amazing and cool. I would just love to it's see fun. it. It's fun. I can't tell you how many times I've crashed a B-52. Lately, so. <laughs> <laughs> I crashed one too. That sounds like a lot of fun. All right. Well, thanks for sharing those. Um, so I think those are great. Romeo, now from your perspective and being in the manufacturing world, Share with us what you, how you think Edge could help in that world and, and resolve some of these problems. I'll tell you if you, you know, let me join the field trip uh, <laughs> with, with Tom on that. But I totally yeah, you gotta, gotta talk. talk to Tom. We gotta be nice to Tom on this <laughs> webinar. That's our goal. <laughs> so, so I would agree with Tom, first of all, right? Uh, I think everything he said um, is, is near and dear to my heart. And again, we are 
a user of this technology. We are trying to re revolutionize a Flintstones industry, right? Uh, rock grinding is our is our thing, and and of course, you know, building automation and industrial IoT platform definitely is something that we are heavily investing on. So again, in the manufacturing space, um, industrial IoT platforms are expected you know, to improve operational efficiency by first capitalizing on on analytics and, and the AI AI based uh, tool sets you know, that that are you know available in at our disposal uh, right now you know. and having edge platforms will definitely speed up you know the the, the processing and improve the data gathering of the shop uh, floor data sets offloading heavy transmission and central processing like what, uh, like what Tom said. No. This will make uh, transaction processing and analytics more lightweight, bite-sized, and easier to digest. Okay, thank you for sharing that. That is, is super helpful. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm moving the slide ahead, just getting too excited here. Um, so I would like to, I know there's companies out there that are actually kind of leading in building edge platforms. I'd like to just take a minute and ask a couple of you to share what, what they're actually doing, share with us some examples. And maybe Max, I can start with you on that one. Uh, sure. And when it comes to technologies, I think are crucial uh, for the edge deployment and uh, one of the priorities for edge deployment, I would like to focus on three uh, specific categories of these technologies. Uh, the first one is the platform itself. And uh, to me, the platform is essentially somewhere that you can deploy these capabilities, some, uh, somewhere, something that can host your applications be it uh, data gathering or analytics uh, or machine learning or just applications. And uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, that uh, Kubernetes is slowly kind of getting from the just cloud deployment space into the edge space as well. And I really hope that ultimately uh, we will become standardized on Kubernetes across the board that will help us uh, to build applications in a more kind of unified way across the cloud and the edge. Uh, the second uh, thing I want to talk about is the databases because again, data, uh, data when it comes to edge is a problem and it's uh, not just analytics, but uh, again, managing application data. It, it's hard to, uh, to, to point out a specific technology that, that has already solved this, this, this problem. I would, I, I, I would say that we are in the early days. Uh, I can point out companies like uh, Macrometa that, for example, create a database uh, uh, that is specifically geared towards uh, multi location deployment uh, and is designed to be deployed in hundreds or thousands of locations and replicate the data with a very interesting patterns and also host some of the applications uh, as a part of it. The third one uh, is uh, AI. And uh, obviously one of the AI capabilities that, uh, that are becoming very popular for the, uh, for the edge deployment is uh, computer vision, uh, image analytics, video analytics. Uh, and uh, we see that in connected cars, we see that in retail, we see that pretty much everywhere. Generally speaking, AI platforms, which again, Many of them are based on Kubernetes and Kubeflow and just deploying AI capabilities on top. That's fantastic. And do, do you have, are there any examples you can share with us of companies that are doing any of this? And if I put you on the spot, feel free to say no. But oh, no, a good example of, for example, a company that is deploying Kubernetes across the board is uh, Chick-fil-A. They, uh, they went with their uh, public story around their uh, success story around deploying Kubernetes. Uh, in all of their stores uh, and then hosting applications in a unified way there. And, uh, and I think that's a great example of uh, how platforms like Kubernetes can become a new standard and finally marry this, uh, uh, the edge deployment and cloud deployment and help with, uh, help with innovation at the edge. Uh, because uh, like, uh, uh, like Tom and Romeo said before, innovation at the edge is, uh, is important and uh, we Ultimately, we want to create more applications. We want to create uh, more customer experience, and we want to do it faster. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And and Brad, can I ask you? Do you do you look at certain companies and go, they're doing a great job of leading this edge platform march? Yeah, you know, so 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 I don't just say the same things that Max did because. I think what he said is, is absolutely true. Another example to look at uh, beyond Chick-fil-A uh, is, uh, for example, Target. Um, you know, they've discussed uh, publicly their Target application platform, and they've basically said, 
um, technology is the basis of their innovation. It's not just a cost of doing business. Uh, and they have systematically invested in building a, a platform that runs Target. And an application developer doesn't have to write an application for a cloud or for uh, an edge device or for uh, a telco edge. Um, they write an application and someone else helps decide where you deploy it. And so they built a fluid platform across their compute spectrum uh, where they can just decide where's the best place to run an application. Uh, it's a, it's a small um, value proposition that I exposed in that statement though. Uh, but what the thing I want people to hear is you know, cloud um, development technologies, as mentioned earlier, uh, we have so many developers that are graduating with this strength and this skill set. There's no reason to invent something new for the edge. And we don't necessarily want to maintain multiple kinds of environments across an organization. So if you can find a way in your organization to use the same tools, technologies, processes, um, you know, that's when it becomes a platform, right? An edge platform that you can write one application and choose where to deploy it uh, with your vendors, you know, across different hosting environments at your edge, um, at your, you know, connectivity provider edge, you know, wherever that might be. I think that's an exciting, exciting value in, in investing in the edge. Yeah, so I think I think your point is great, which is that if you really want to have your your infrastructure be able to scale, that you've got to figure out how you build not individual solutions, but rather a platform that works across all the pieces. Mm -hmm. I think that's really smart. I also love the Target story because I think you probably a lot of you've heard the story of Target, but early on they were able to use data about customers so so incredibly effectively that they could figure out which of their customers were pregnant. And then they started marketing to those customers, selling them all sorts of things for their, you know, coming new baby. And it actually backfired on them because people felt very creepy about it. It's like, how did you know I'm pregnant? I didn't share that very personal information with you. You know, there are certain people in my family who don't know yet, yet, yet Target knows. But I think there is a real interest on the part of, you know, consumers and companies to better know each other. And of course you have to be careful when you're playing with fire, but I do think ultimately it is an edge platform that is gonna be able to solve these problems for us. So I think that is uh, pretty exciting uh, in terms of getting to the future. Okay, so let's turn to data. We've talked a lot about data today, kind of in and around it, but I wanna focus head on with data because I think we all realize how much data is gonna be collected, is being collected, and I'm wondering, you know, and, and Romeo, I'm going to toss this to you, but what do you think are going to be the challenges, not only in collecting data, but in making the data useful to your company? First of all, let me chime in on the target story since you guys already started it. So <laughs> to continue with that story, actually, what, what happened one day, right? And so a teenager, she got pregnant, unfortunately, and she actually received, you know, uh, gift cards from from Target, you know, because she was browsing, um, you know, items for babies, etc. So she actually received a gift card you know, from Target, saying, "Hey, congratulations! You're looking for this, so we are giving you discounts and this and that." So that's when too much data is dangerous, right? And and that that is a challenge by itself on on the perspective, you know, we're threatening on dangerous ground between privacy and security, right? So, so I think that's one important challenge that we need to be aware of. The second one, again, I think most companies like us is that there are so many, so many data sets out there, but there's so little time and very few data analysts to make sense out of those data, right? In our case, for example, we collect tons of data, you know, sensing information from, you know, temperature, rotations, vibrations, resonance, visual information, and a whole gamut of data sets. No? But, you know, transmitting them, you know, to their final destination uh, to be processed and consumed by the final decision makers is still a major setback. This, I believe, can be addressed using edge, edge platforms partially, you know, but not entirely, but at least that, that, that data gathering part, you know, definitely um, edge platforms will definitely help. No? Again, the, the problem of ana the analysis and, and, and very few 
data analysts who can actually process those will still remain there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I love your comments. Thank you for, thank you for giving more uh, color to the target story as well. So Tom, I want to turn to you and ask you, you know, with the examples you've given, it's pretty clear there's going to be a lot of data. What's your take on that? The whole purpose of IoT and everything is to make this plethora of information available. We can do all kinds of things with it. We can turn it into machine learning, AI, those types of things are going to be great. But that data is going to come out as fast and furious. So the challenges to me are how we sort that. How do we make use of it? How do we identify it and what to do with it to start with immediately? So one of the projects we're doing is called Project Searchlight. We're working out at USC and we're working with DARP on this. So data comes in and there's thresholds of classification. So the first one it looks at and it says, what is this data in general? You know, oh, it's HTTPS. Is it data I even care about? right? Or is it data that's compromised? So maybe I need to take a little better look at this. Maybe it's got some problems with it. And, and then you go through these various series of that. And it has to do that, you know, in milliseconds and less to get that data and get the value out of it. Uh, also, that data is coming at us so fast is how do we do this with software defined uh, uh, networks. So radios are software defined. Every device is software defined and we can create it. So the Google cars were mentioned earlier. One of the things we've been looking at is how do we transmit data from uh, self self-driving cars and so forth as they're going down the road, download that info rather than them having to come to a station and unload it and those types of things. How can we use this data then to turn it into actionable items? For instance, we monitor the data, and this is part of what we call our polymorphic networking capabilities is we're monitoring data coming in. We see this sense of IoT. So we see an accelerometer. We see the velocity. We see a temperature and a few, and we go, oh, that's a pump. We know what that is. So our solution automatically creates the machine learning for it, locks it up to the machine, trains it for 200 seconds, then says, I got it, and then reports itself back to the system and says, we got a pump online now in Western Texas, and it's sending this data and then starts sending data to the data lake, all doing this as an object. So you're just not an IoT device hooked to the network. The pump just became a node on the network. So that's the level that I think Edge will do for us and make those data things and the nodes themselves will become part of the network. I love that. <laughs> I do because, I mean, it seems like we're getting to smaller and smaller pieces are now being networked, which is gonna, and have intelligence, which ultimately is gonna lead to much better solutions. But I loved your combining the thought of, you know, data and IT in order to get to something that's really usable, you need to combine data and uh, AI together. And that combination of data and AI is a, is a killer combination. But I also like your point about setting priorities. And I think these are all things that are super illuminating and helpful for us to think of as we're thinking about how to make the best use of data. So I want to turn back to potholes for a minute. And I want to ask you guys about, have you seen people try to implement edge technology and make mistakes? Or just as you think about it, are there things that would concern you that our audience needs to think about as they begin to really push their edge technology? So, you know, what are those, what are those potential mistakes or pitfalls out there? Max, let me start with you on this one. Sure. And uh, in this case, I would lead not with technology, but I would lead with customer experience. And I would say that uh, like one of the major pitfalls would be uh, not thinking about customer experience or not analyzing that um, uh, enough. Uh, because uh, there, there is a story from Walmart. They did an experiment uh, for three years. Uh, they implemented uh, and uh, unleashed a bunch of robots to roam their stores on the aisles to check the inventory levels and uh, kind of do all that stuff. But ultimately they canceled it for a number of reasons. It turned out that it's not that efficient and uh, they were also freaking out customers because imagine that you are going to Walmart and then what, who meets you there is a robot who is uh, kind of walking down the store and it's not a small robot, it's like six foot something uh, device. Uh, so it might be just uh, challenging for customers to understand that and uh, to accept that. It's an edge use case. Uh, was it good? Who knows? Maybe in the future we will all see robots in the stores, but uh, maybe not right now. And like, for example, maybe right now in order to perform a similar task, uh, you use a combination of uh, kind of human beings and uh, 
maybe a better solution would be just to uh, have a bunch of cameras on the floor. Maybe they will be less precise, but at least they will not freak out the customers as much. Okay. Thank you for my dose of humor this morning. I was, I was laughing so hard. It's a good thing I was on mute, but it's a very funny vision. I do know right now, just as a side note, that uh, Walmart now has is testing some robots again, but this time they are robots that make smoothies in the store and they don't walk around. They're just in a, in a one unit and they make smoothies. And so there's no human touch to it, which is a really great product during a global pandemic. So, you know, perhaps they'll be more successful with this more specific solution this time, but uh, yeah, super interesting. Um, Tom, how about you? Have you seen, you know, pitfalls or things that we should be concerned about as we go to implement an edge platform? Yeah. Yeah. But one real quick thing, I, I saw a robot and it takes oranges and these oranges are all over it. It takes the oranges in, it makes orange juice out of them, but it takes the peelings from the oranges and makes cups out of them at the same time. So you get your orange juice in a cup made out of orange peels. It was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. Where can we get this? Uh, it was in France, but it was really cool. Oh, but <laughs> I, I It's a one of a kind. So it just caught my idea. And I went, I got to tell you about that. You got to look that it. up. I it's out it. there on the web. You got to see it. Oh, so man. data challenges, uh, or excuse me, uh, the pitfalls. I'm sorry. So I, I guess there's three critical items for me uh, being the guy that, yeah, we make the pipes and everything. And we also do all the technologies that go with it. But uh, you got to do some basics. So, you know, a software defined network, I guess, is, is key to it. Uh, it's a hybrid of wired and wireless technologies. It has endpoints and, and it connects users to the right compute services. Connecting to the right services is important. And also, can you distribute those services and so forth where you need to? The other one is a, a hybrid cloud diversity. We talk about edge and we, we kind of hinted on this in some areas, but the venue of cloud is there's embedded in the network, there's edge locations, and there's resident at the premises. And then there's even metro locations and so forth. And then there's a traditional cloud way out there. And what do we use those things for, right? Some processes can happen in a metro area, others can happen in other words. So you wanna think through what you're trying to do. Do I have a web page that I'm trying to produce across the world and give the same experience in 14 languages? Uh, using a common platform, okay? That's that's a different view than I'm trying to park cars and find parking spaces for people, okay? Different set of rules. Managed orchestration, I think, is a big part of, of if you don't get that right and you don't have the right support for that, how do you deploy apps and services? How do you execute them in the right venue, on the right NAM work, and how do you get the right secure operational controls to go with them? Those are the big three. And then you got to wrap this thing in security, and you got to stop all those other bad problems that are out there. So you've got to look through those things in that manner. So those are just kind of the big things you want to do. Yeah. And the, the, a very interesting and really helpful answer. And it's making me think like the next time we all meet and talk about this, we need to have at least a day because there are so many uh, interesting things you all are saying that I'd love to delve more deeply in. And I know our audience would as well. But since we're you know, running short on time here, I'm going to ask you guys uh, one more question. And I, I'm i really interested in for those people who are on this call and are kind of thinking, how do I get started? What are the things I need to think about? You know, should I be, uh, you know, training my team, hiring new people? Should I be asking for outside resources? You know, how, how should I be getting the budget or thinking about the budget for this? There's so many things that might be on their minds, but it's really about pragmatically, what are the things you need to think about to really get started building out your edge platform? And maybe, you know, three pieces of advice from each of you for our listeners would be really helpful. And um, maybe, uh, Romeo, I can start with you. Sure, Jim. Again, to my mind, it's a question of in-source versus outsource, right? So I think uh, it will definitely be a hybrid mode for me, right? So let me tell you why. Uh, first, usually in-house subject matter experts, you know, they have better understanding of the processes and the peculiarities of your business, right? They have what I call the tribal knowledge, which an external subject matter expert may not necessarily have. But on the other hand, outsourced SMEs, right, bring different perspective on things 
new capabilities and new solutions to address the problem. So to me, I believe uh, you know it must be a combination or a hybrid of both in-source and outsourced experts working together to get the best of both worlds. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And I also think when you look at people who come from the outside, they've done they've done this not exactly to what your company needs, but they've been through it a few times and they know where those potholes are. Uh, you know, they may not know everything about your organization, but they're going to know the vast majority of them. So I think your point is is very well taken. Um, Brad, how about you? You know, one of the things I think that uh, concerns me about getting started um, is kind of the chicken and egg. Do you build a modern cloud native platform for your edge and wait for the use case? Or do you run with your use case and just deploy it and see if you can learn from it and con you know, convince yourself that it was the right thing to do and your organization invests in it? So I think that trade-off needs to be understood as uh, shortcuts to avoid. Right? We already have on-premises compute. That's not new, we've had it for decades. What we're trying to change though is how you deploy and how you support and how you use that um, investment for future growth to solve the next problem, which we're not even thinking about yet. So that's one, understand what problem you're solving and how you're getting ready for the future for the unknown problems. And then I think the other that I would um, you know, end with, uh, all along those lines, yeah, I think Max will probably speak about the team challenges, right? Of, old mentality of keep everything running versus a new mentality of experiment and be agile and be nimble. Um, so that'd be my number two. The number three is just build off of what Tom said earlier. And a software defined everything, networking, software defined storage, software defined compute. Um, we need to you know, embrace that and, and, and utilize it fully. So go for this mentality called infrastructure as code, where not just your applications are written as code and, and controlled by process, but your infrastructure itself is recorded as code and is maintained by that same agile process uh, so that you can revision it and with a new version, push it out to your edges and see that infrastructure, the networking, the storage, and you know, the resource allocation um, you know, materialize based on that new, uh, new deployment. Uh, I think that's gonna be a critical mentality for people uh, to absorb, to really uh, get some of the benefit out of this new, this new wave of edge computing. Yeah, that's super interesting. And, and really, I think what you're encouraging us to do is to think differently about our architecture mm -hmm. based on the problem we're trying to solve, which I really love. I think that's great advice. Um, Tom, how about you? What are your three kind of pieces of advice here? Well, um, it's a difficult question for everybody. Everybody has such a nuance to what they're doing and where they're at in life. Uh, from a company like Lumen here, uh, I mean, we have partners like Intel and others that we have all kinds of help, right? So we do a lot of development with these these partners. And I have a lot of startups I bring in also under our, what we call the Pelican Innovation Partnership down here in Louisiana. So we do a lot of things. But I would say, uh, like the Chick-fil-A, you guys were talking about, one of our first edge projects was their advanced lemon processing plant. Basically lemons go in one end and pulp and uh, lemonade comes out the other side, right? So we went in there, we started off doing, you know, just edge compute networking form and helping with it. And then as we went through this, the robotics person Rockwell, they were having these questions, discovery sessions, and all of a sudden, we're doing application integration and the managed Wi-Fi and communications, 5G, you know, private 5G and the network form to support those things. So edge is a much larger picture than just it's edge. No, that's like saying, oh, it's 5G, and it's going to solve all our problems. No, it's what do you do with it that matters and how do you link it into the other things? Then you got to integrate security solutions. So we were asked to do that. And then eventually we did overall project management on it. So the success there is now leading to them considering building 50 more of these factories in the U.S. because of the integration and the value that the edge seemed to give them in their manufacturing. This is a totally no person plant. It's all done by robotics and that integration and that speed, that five millisecond response I've talked about or less is critical in those environments to do those types of things. Um, I think one thing you also need to understand is microservices and what that means and what it really is. It's not some 
it's not some mystic thing. You can get your hands around and you can understand what it is and you can define, am I going to do microservices for faster reduces? And then what's that technology stack that you're going to put behind it makes a difference. Uh, for instance, one of the things, like I mentioned polymorphic. Uh, we're doing a lot of that. To me, that's the next step in edge. You know, that's where we're looking at it. Uh, we've got partners all over the place. For instance, we're looking at neuromorphic processors. Uh, to me, you know, Intel doesn't want to hear this, but FPGAs, oh, they've been there, done that. I'm looking for the next thing in my life. So neuromorphic processors that basically I can define what goes on that chip, build it. And if I don't need it anymore, I destroy it. It doesn't need to be on the chip anymore. So we get rid of it and we only build it when we need those things. Um, so you got to think of that as you're going forward. But the three Cree things we talked about earlier and getting that look of what you want an understanding edge for truly what it is, not what you're seeing on somebody's slide set. You need to really delve into it and understand it, have some partners come in and help you and go through that process of the hybrid process of doing discovery. And then you determine I'm ready for this. I can build it or I can have somebody help me. I'll bring in people as I need them. There's, there's, a, there's a different way to do that. So you've got you've to do that project planning up front, that PM that you got to do up front. Okay, that was a lot of wisdom and I really appreciate that. And I also love the fact that you actually took lemons and made lemonade out of it. That's pretty amazing. I love it. You see what I can um, do with four pounds of dirt. So <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to know, I don't think. But uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, so let's wrap it up, Max. Maybe you can share your final thoughts. We're in our last couple of minutes of this webinar. So we'd love to hear from you to wrap it up. Sure. Uh, so we are all in agreement that innovation is coming um, uh, to the edge use cases and edge computing. And, uh, and the speed to market uh, will be uh, extremely uh, important. Uh, so uh, when, uh, when companies uh, you know, start their journeys uh, towards uh, uh, renovating what they have at the edge, uh, they need to think about changing the development and delivery culture that they have there to maybe resemble similar to what uh, companies currently have in the cloud and approach it from this digital transformation perspective. Think about agile, think about DevOps, think about microservices, think about continuous delivery. Uh, maybe continuous delivery will not be required for uh, uh, B52, but uh, hopefully for majority of other use cases, they will be relevant. The second thing I wanted to say is, uh, uh, of course, when you start building your edge use cases, uh, you need to think about the platform. It is indeed a chicken and an egg, and you need to figure out how to balance that. Uh, but platform is important. You don't want to just build a couple of one-offs uh, that will hold the process and innovation in the long run. Uh, and there, uh, all these uh, technologies uh, that we already talked about, uh, the software defined everything, microservices platforms, um, Kubernetes networking, and so on and so forth, it will help. Uh, it will help to increase uh, the speed to market, and it will help to increase the uh, the, 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 the speed of innovation. Because uh, ultimately, the the power of it is uh, basically to like cloud decouple the, the infrastructure and, and applications. We need to do a very similar thing with the edge, although maybe they will be a little bit more coupled, uh, but still that is required for a higher speed of innovation. And uh, lastly, of course, you need to figure out a use case to begin with. Otherwise, uh, if you just invest a lot of time and money in the platform uh, and not build any use case on top of that, then uh, uh, you will have questions from your executive team. Why did you spend all that money? Yeah, great. I love that. Great wrap up. Great summary of, I think, some of the key things we heard. I know we're running out of time. I want to first thank our panelists. You guys were amazing. I really enjoyed talking to you. I hope the audience enjoyed it too. This was really fantastic with great advice and great stories. Uh, I'm ready to do this again anytime you're up for it. Um, I want to thank Grid Dynamics, who uh, actually sponsored this webinar and brought it to us. So thank you very much for doing that. But most of all, I want to thank you, our audience, for coming to this, sitting and listening and learning. We're going to make sure you get a copy of the recording. You can check back on things that our experts said. You can share it with uh, people you work with or others. And we'll also let you know about our future webinars, which I think based on who you are and why you came will probably be of interest to you. So thanks so much for joining us today. We really appreciated you being here. And I'm hoping you have a great rest of your day and that we see you soon on another webinar. Talk to you later. Bye.